Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're back for another episode of Steel and Whiskey. So uh, Chris is already going after the whiskey here. Uh, the The last episode, I, I got a new whiskey called Chicken Cock here. And uh, our guest today, Chris Rogers, he's very excited about it. He, he, he couldn't uh, wait till we started recording to start drinking. So uh, it's pretty good stuff. But uh We've had a few external guests on our podcast here lately, and uh, thought we'd switch it up a little bit and bring on a uh, guest that is works for uh, All Plan and SDS Two. Uh, Chris, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm been with well SDS Two since 2007. Okay. So a while, a while now. Uh, started out as a developer. Um, the last couple of years, I've been doing uh, Scrum Master. Scrum. Okay. So <laughs> I'd I'd be willing to bet most of our audience doesn't know what what the heck is a Scrum Master. Uh, what does that mean? Essentially, I help teams in uh, developing the software. Usually, just by asking stupid questions and forcing the team to think about what they're doing, um, <laughs> help organize, um, kind of run meetings um, to some extent. And then if they have external problems that they can't solve um, on the team with the resources that they have, I do my best to clear those external problems out of the way. OK, OK. Um, so just to give everybody a little bit of an idea of all of this. So uh, we we use a process here at SDS2 called Scrum. And at any point in time, I'm kind of the guy, I, I kind of know a little bit about Scrum, like, but you're very uh, knowledgeable and educated in yeah. the area of how this process works and whatever, what role everybody plays and the different things. So just at any point in time, if I say something out of line, feel free to correct me. Uh, but so we use a process here called Scrum. Um, you know, it, it's comprised of basically, you know, the teams get together, plan out what we call sprints. Uh, sprint is a, essentially, you know, a period of time, not a not a set period of time. It could could vary, could be two weeks or four weeks or whatever. Um, where we're pulling towards a goal, right? So we sit together, we plan things out, uh, determine, okay, it's gonna take us three weeks, for example, to reach our goal and, and complete all these tasks. Uh, and then, you know, along the way, the team is always communicating, working together, trying to refine things where they have to, uh, bringing up additional problems that may arise throughout the process. Uh, and then at the end of that sprint, they do what we call a sprint review, right? So that sprint review is uh, essentially team gets together and we meet with our internal stakeholders as well as external stakeholders a lot of time to gain feedback, make sure the work that we did is on par with expectations um, and, and it's going in the right direction. So. It's a really beneficial uh, process, works really well. Um, Chris, I would ask you maybe to explain some of the benefits of that process to us. So I, I can explain like what we go through a little bit, high level, obviously there's a lot more to it, but what are the benefits of this process? Uh, the, real, the real benefit is that the individuals who need information have the information when they need to do the work. Um, and that's accomplished in Scrum by having a product owner or in your case, product manager uh, with the product owner under who is prioritizing uh, work, saying this is the most valuable to our customer and it goes to the top of what we call our backlog. And that way the, the developers know uh, this is the most efficient way to deliver value to our customers. And they can plan their sprint um, anywhere between two and four weeks for a sprint. Mm -hmm. um, they can plan their sprint around delivering that specific value to the customer. And then 
um, the reason we cap out at four weeks for a sprint is so that we don't fall behind in case something changes. So if you, midway through the sprint, you happen to discover that something we thought was valuable, maybe wasn't as valuable, um, then when we have the review, we can correct and then we can go again. Mm -hmm. uh, we focus on delivering um, an increment of the product each sprint that adds value. Mm -hmm. So I like so the um, I always think about it too, so that we use those kind of short increments or short periods of time that helps us stay on task, stay on track, but that also helps us be flexible and agile and be able to shift quickly as well. If we do is that. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's part of it for sure, um, especially if like expectation changes mm -hmm. uh, as it often does, um, or the market changes as it often does, then then you are in a space where you haven't spent six months developing something that is now useless, mm -hmm. right? You can pivot and, and change. Um, the other really nice thing about it is it really focuses for the developers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Instead of, I know you were here for the old days, but like if you don't have, <laughs> if you don't have a structure in place, um, it's very easy to get distracted. Right. Yeah. It's very easy for someone to come to your office and say, hey, this is really important. And as a developer, it's hard to say, well, I don't I don't agree that that's important. And so you end up with a lot of um, just kind of chasing focus all over the place. Right. right. And context switching, which is very difficult. Um, a, a large part of software development when you're writing code is that time to. Because it's not you don't just sit down and start like at your peak, right? There's like, mm -hmm. there's a there's a ramp up and where you're really running and really actually writing code and understanding what you're doing and understanding the context that you are in. And so if you're constantly switching the context, um, one, you will get less done, two, you'll produce subpar code. You're just not as uh, cohesive when you're writing. Um, and so the focus aspect of Scrum and saying, this is our goal, um, and then planning out what it takes to achieve that goal really allows the developers to focus on the actual uh, task of writing the code, not having to worry about what context am I in? Do I have to switch tomorrow? Uh, and it gives a really nice kind of stability and cadence for the developers as they're writing and trying to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. OK, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, we So before we get too too deep in here, I feel like we just dove right in and went right at it. So uh, we always got to talk about what whiskey we're drinking. Uh, I mentioned already, Chris likes the chicken cock, uh, seems to, to really enjoy it. So whoever was on here, uh, the last episode, you saw me open that one up. Uh, and I have a Irish whiskey, it's called Sons of Baron. And, you know, it's not that great, but I'm going to drink it anyway. So I'll yeah. try some after just, yeah. just to see. <laughs> got to test it out. Yeah, I got to make sure. Yeah. Make sure I'm not full of crap. Yeah, well, this is great. Yeah, yeah. delicious. Good. Very good. Are you are you normally a uh, whiskey drinker? Do you drink, do you drink a lot of whiskey or? Uh, yeah, my, my my poison of choice is bourbon. It's my favorite, okay. yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. by far. Any particular brand or you know, still or anything? Uh, like we said before, I'm uh, I'm usually a cheap buy the jug kind of guy, so I'll buy I'll just buy the Evan Williams and put it in a fancy decanter. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, if I'm if I'm going uh, a little more expensive, um, not too much more expensive, but I really like the uh, Rye Bullet. Uh, the bullet rod bullet. Yeah. with the green label, yep. um, 90, 90, 90, 95, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that stuff's really good. Yeah. Um, the uh, Jefferson Reserve, I think, is really good for a reasonable price. Uh, okay. I don't spend a lot of money on myself most of the time. So, like, I, I usually don't buy a whole lot of – sometimes I'll get an expensive bottle for, for like, my birthday or for Christmas or something. But uh, – so I'm not really well versed in the expensive – the expensive <laughs> – or if I come here, right? I don't want to Neither one of these are really all that expensive. Yeah. Uh, the this Irish whiskey is, I think it was maybe like a thirty or forty dollar bottle, and the the other one here is, uh, I think it was about sixty bucks. Yeah, so it's really good. I'm gonna nothing, nothing over the top, but yeah, really nice. for the price. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to beat that one, I would say for sure. So <laughs> yeah. So um, how did how did you let's go back to kind of our process and get people a little bit 
insiders look here on a little bit of our processes and such. So um, how did you become, I guess, how did you become like well versed in this scrum master role uh, and understanding the process so well? How did that come about? A lot of reading. Uh, most of my day is actually spent reading. Uh-huh. If I'm not in a in a meeting, um, I'm reading something. Um, I've taken two of the professional Scrum Master courses that are offered okay. at Scrum.org. Um, I just finished up the second certification earlier this year, um, and then a lot of a lot of experience, right? Like when um, Michael uh, first proposed Scrum three years ago. Now um, we started doing it as I started as a developer. Mm-hmm shuffleboard uh, yeah ignore the background noise there's a lot going on today so um, i started as a developer and i thought it was really interesting uh because i really appreciate the uh, again like at the cadence of it like as a developer it's really easy to get overwhelmed because the release is got to go out tomorrow or summit is tomorrow or this big sale is coming up or something is coming along that is um increasing the pressure on developers to just quote get something done Mm-hmm. And um, once we switched over to Scrum, after a few, you know, bumps in the road, uh, we settled into a very nice cadence that's comfortable for the developers to maintain. Uh, so it lowers the burnout, and it actually makes working a lot more enjoyable <clears throat> because all that information is um, is the developers not accountable for the information. If that makes sense, sure. right? So. Sure instead of having to like getting a task and going okay we'll figure it out and then having to do all the research mm-hmm. and go ask everybody how something is supposed to work or what should it look like now there's a role for that in scrum called the product owner mm-hmm. the product owner is responsible for researching understanding what the customer is actually looking for and then they're there as a resource information for the developer mm-hmm. and that's a, just a really efficient way to handle um the information, which is the most important part of software development between the customer and the developer, is that okay. that kind of product owner role or product management role. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just really enjoyed the I really enjoyed the framework. And so I started reading a lot about it. And uh, when the position became available here, uh, I was just good enough to get hired. <laughs> <laughs> just good enough. Uh, so then you were a de- you developed before you were a scrum master correct, correct? Yeah, you yeah. were you were one of the guys behind the scenes writing the code all that good stuff so mm-hmm. okay and you had enough had enough coding or, or um i still enjoy it i still yeah. do occasionally here because i um i also help answer um external developer questions mm. um through the hubspot um, through the external development email. So that's for uh, people writing on the external oh, yeah. developers that are writing uh, programs on our API. You're a professional, you know how to do this. They're helping, you're helping them when they send in yeah, questions yeah. to us, right? Uh, okay. Yeah, yep. external developers from our customers who are writing towards the Python API. Um, and, or .NET. And the .NET. And .NET. Uh, and uh, .NET. I usually so handle Python. Have, yeah, we have two. So, well, yeah, you were probably uh, you were a developer. I was a Python developer. Yeah, Python. Here, yeah. You did a lot in Python. Right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I remember that. So, yeah, uh, yes. we do. Yeah, we do have the .NET yep. API now. We've got maintain both. So correct. Both are great. Both have their uh, pros and cons, like everything else. So, um, I just I, I, I find the yeah. the process of developing cohesive software way more interesting mm-hmm. than um, the actual coding of itself. So at home, sometimes I'll toy around with something for fun, just when I feel the urge to to write some code. But sure. typically, I just I find the whole systemic process way more interesting than individual like coding tasks. Okay. Okay. What's uh? So you did a lot of Python, right? Yeah. Do, do you like uh? So tell me a little bit. I always kind of wonder this a little bit. I, I kind of know some of the answers uh but obviously i'm not a developer so uh what's the the what makes python so great python python is good it's popular yes what what makes it what makes python so great uh, good about that it's easy to read um there's not i don't know if you've ever seen like c code 
or JavaScript code. A little, yeah, a little bit. Lots of curly braces everywhere. Yeah. Lots of yeah. so Python does away with all that. It's all uh, spacing mm -hmm. as opposed to breaking it up with braces. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really easy to read. It is. It was designed to be close to human language, if that makes sense. It's like designed to be like close to English. Sure. Um, which makes it kind of easy for beginners to hop in and um, understand the syntax mm -hmm. somewhat easily in the beginning. Um, and it is built in a way that lends itself to like API stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's real, it's a scripting language. Um, so it's real popular um, because of its ease of use um, for non-developers uh, or um, so for APIs, like for our API, yeah. we chose Python because it's a relatively easy uh, way to start programming. And uh, a lot of when you if you go somewhere and start learning programming, Python is quite often an uh, introductory language Got because it. of its ease of use and understanding. Um, it's really easy to go in and write your first program, you know, mm -hmm. loop over some lists or print some stuff out to the screen. Yeah. Uh, it's real close to natural language, which is really nice yeah. and it's pretty. Yeah, I, I've I've dabbled a little bit doing stuff on our API. So I, our API is a different story. But it's, I thought, uh, it's a <laughs> it's kind of close to natural language, not really, but it, it still takes a certain uh, mindset and thought process, I would say, to develop. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. In, yeah, in yeah. any language, really. Yeah. So, it, yeah. And but, once you once you know one. Once you understand one, shifting back and forth between multiple sure. languages becomes a little easier. Sure. So, and, and I always think about it as, I mean, like it's an entirely different or new. Just think about language in general. Take the take the programming off of it, right? You're yeah, learning yeah, an yeah, entirely learning new language. language. Yeah. It's like Spanish or German yeah. or whatever. It's an entire new language. Yeah. So yeah, that, syntax. that can be very yep. difficult or challenging, I imagine. Huh? It, it can be. It kind of depends on what you're doing. Um, but for the if you understand, because like most things, programming is just organizing information <laughs> to an extent. <laughs> okay. okay. So if you understand how the information is organized, then it's just a matter of uh, understanding the syntax of the language, mm -hmm. which might be slightly different between like Python or JavaScript or Python and C++, but the the fundamental portion of like, this is a list, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, yeah, a list. A list is, a, and for our audience who wouldn't know, a list is basically like, it's a, it's list. a collection of, yeah, it's a but list. Like, you, and, you and I understand. Well, I, I mean, but even but in the, yeah, in like, just for, a collection of different values yeah. or items. Or yeah, whatever, or you right? can like, like, think of like a grocery list. Yes, right? exactly. But in, in C++, that would, they would call it an array or a vector yeah. or okay. some other, you know, we're pretentious, getting, we're pretentious getting, name. We're yeah. getting really deep into the program. Yeah, so. yeah. well, I mean, that's, that's, what, okay. that's what makes Python so nice. <laughs> is it's called a list. Right? Yeah, it's a grocery it's, list. It's a grocery list, right? Yeah. It's called a list. It's so, not a... So we got to figure out, is there milk in our list? Is there, do we need to get any? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah fruits, vegetables, what, what do we got to get at the grocery store, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, okay, so uh, we, so that's the Python side a little bit, you know, quick, quick look into that. And then we have our .NET API. What is different about .NET? What makes that popular? Does it have advantages over Python? Um, the real advantage is it's, uh, and I am not a .NET expert. I just actually just started going through the tutorial that we have on our web okay. on the website to yeah. to kind of get in and help it from a beginner's perspective, uh, mm -hmm. help make the tutorial a little cleaner and a little easier to get through. Yeah. Um, uh, the big advantage for .NET is that it integrates with everything. Mm -hmm. Like you can write your own API in .NET that you can then use in .NET and then present to other people in .NET. So it's all just one like, cohesive <laughs> ecosystem. Okay. Which makes it very easy to um, write and then distribute. Yeah. Um, and it's also real powerful for like for us, what makes it very powerful is there's a lot of .NET developers mm -hmm. available. And so um, 
when we write to the .NET API, we open up a lot of opportunities for those developers or for our customers to uh, hire a developer or maybe third-party contract out to a developer to, because that ecosystem for C Sharp, which is the language used um, in .NET, well, it's one of the languages used in .NET, it's the most popular. Mm -hmm. um, that ecosystem makes it really easy to get into .NET API programming. Okay. Uh, and it allows, just a lot of opportunity to find it, right? It's just yeah. So why why is there you kind of talk about just there's a large number of developers who are versed in .NET. Why what what makes that like so popular? Why are there so many that uh, know that? A lot of it is uh, Microsoft's marketing is really good. Okay. And so this is kind of a Microsoft. Oh yeah, .NET is Microsoft. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's uh, run by Microsoft, and because they have a very large market share, mm -hmm. um, when they put out tools like this, they're often widely adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, they also are really good about getting into schools, yeah. um, giving out licenses for schools, educational licenses, and mm -hmm. things like that, mm -hmm. which make it really easy to access and at super low cost. Which means that you can flood the market with um, you know, .NET developers because they have access to it in school. The teachers have access to it without having to worry about licensing and paying for that. You know, it's a real low entry point. Um, and it comes with, you know, it works with Windows right away. There's not any messing about, like... I think it is correct, but... I think there's not any messing about with it um, to get it running. It's, um, their documentation is real nice, which is a big help. <laughs> really big help. The documentation works well. Um, and just it kind of is one of those things. It was also probably right place, right time, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a lot more prevalent in software than you would imagine it to be. So we got a lot of people in the background over here. We're we're out in our atrium, so I I just need to check to see if anybody want, else wants to come say hi. Quick, did Mich do you want to say hi? <laughs> hi. <laughs> Michelle, Michelle's making a guest appearance here, Steph, so they had to go, yeah, steal a, a drink of whiskey. <laughs> Sorry for the interruption there. <laughs> so we were, uh, .NET, yeah, .NET, Scrum, Python, all that. Um, what, what sort of challenges does our team face regularly? Like, what, what? You know, there's the old saying, if if it was easy, everybody would do it, right? And not many people are creating uh, steel detailing, steel fabrication software, right? So <clears throat> obviously it's a, that tells me it's probably a difficult problem to solve, a difficult thing to develop, all that. Um, so what kind of challenges does our team face regularly that, that uh, they have to overcome one of the what, over my time here what i've noticed one of the biggest challenges is that a, a lot of shops steel detailing fabrication pick your poison um, have very unique and individualistic ways of working <laughs> if i'm being political uh, yeah um so what that for us what it means is that it's difficult to provide a general solution Mm -hmm. Because, you know, some fabrication shops like it it's one way. There's one fabrication shop that I visited that had everything backwards from the normal. Their 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 drawings were actually um, flipped on the Y axis. Really? Yeah. So they were. Uh, we can name them off. Dimension off. everything yeah. on the right side. Yeah, we can name them off camera that. later. But uh, it doesn't matter uh, who it is. I'm just. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They, so, they're, they're, so their drawings were all backwards yeah. from what you would see as normal. Yeah. And so we end up either having to tell a customer, sorry, we're not going to do it, or we have to add another option, right? And so as we add further and further options, um, one, the customers see it, right? Because the screen gets bigger mm -hmm. and there's more options and there's more understanding. You have to you have to hold more information in your brain to use the software. Um, but two, the code base bloats mm -hmm. and it becomes more difficult for software developers to maintain because not only do we have to worry about the regular 
detail orientation. But now we also have to consider when we make changes, what happens on the reversed detail yeah. orientation. Uh, so maintenance has always been um, a big thing. It's always a big thing, regardless of where you are. Mm -hmm. um, but in, for us, it's always been a very difficult task because uh, the original source code for SDS2 was written in a time when a lot of these practices didn't exist. So there's a lot of, at the time, what were good choices? <laughs> well, you know, uh, a wise person uh, recently told me that, you know, uh, um, if you're, if you're going to complain about a, a process or the way something works or, you know, something you have to do for your daily tasks, somebody probably made that with a good intention. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always assume I don't want good intention. intention absolutely. In 100%. Choices that were made. Was that right? me? Did I say that? I said that yeah. a lot. You're not that far. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> uh, I don't want to disparage them. At the time, the choices they were making were good choices. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because we because software development is still a relatively young discipline in the grand scheme of things. It's, yeah. it's relatively yeah. young, and, yeah. and it changes, you know, so much. I mean, between um between now and when the first line of sds2 code was written um which is only what like 30 years uh goodness like 40 40 40, 40 years 40, yeah, i believe eight, i believe 1981 okay is yeah, when 42 uh, then. that's started so um so we probably we've had multiple generations in between there mm -hmm. I, I don't just mean i mean we're probably talking 10 15 20 generations in terms of actual like um software engineering philosophy right like mm -hmm. we've had dozens of generations over the time so i don't i don't, I don't mean to, i don't want to say that they did we're making bad choices at the time they were very good choices yeah. um but now with the benefit of hindsight they're difficult to maintain yeah just complexity yes sure. and, and yeah. that's always a that's always a, a balance that we have to manage um while we're developing new work mm -hmm. is we um a developer will come across an instance of code that maybe isn't ideal for the current situation. Mm -hmm. And so we have to say, okay, well, do we stop what we're doing mm -hmm. and do we fix this mm -hmm. or do we continue on with the plan and log this for later? Yeah, sure. Um, and a lot of that is up to the and, team. And I would say by fix, you don't mean it's broken. It's just correct. More like refine do we do we uh, little column a little column b i'm sure every, every yeah. situation is different right yeah, but yeah for the most part it's probably more like well this could be a lot more efficient type of thing well, or, most of it or, is, uh, most of it's communication yeah. um between other parts of software that's most of the yeah. most of it is the way that one piece of the software is communicating to another piece of the software okay. yeah and those communication channels change over time mm -hmm. and so if you come back and you you get a piece of code that hasn't been maybe hasn't been touched in a while mm -hmm. hasn't been needed any maintenance or anything um, it's communicating in a totally different way than stuff we're writing you know today mm -hmm. and so you have to kind of tweak the way it communicates with the rest of it okay. um or okay. maybe the way it's changing some other things in the background that you weren't aware of mm -hmm. um software development's crazy well, man i suppose it's not much different than uh human communi communicating and communication amongst humans we're always refining we're always yeah refining. always changing the way that we communicate we communicate yeah and, Next year, I'll probably be able to. Well, hopefully, I'll be able to communicate better than I am today. We hope know, so. Right? Yeah, one day. <laughs> hope it's a big word for sure. So, yeah, the whiskey's still good. Oh, it's, it's great. Yeah, it's whiskey. really, really good. good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, really impressed well, with that one. What? Uh, what? What else? What else you got for us? You got any? Any other? Uh, you know, words of wisdom. Uh, like, you know, don't grow up to be a software developer or anything like that? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. I, I would say one of the things I really like about the, the Scrum is the interaction we do get to have with the customers. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really nice to hear direct feedback. Yeah. Um, the, in many cases, unfiltered opinions mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, from our customers is really nice. Um, the other thing it gives us the opportunity is to, find the root of the actual problem. Yeah. Um, 
and this is not unique to SDS2, so I don't want to mm-hmm. I don't want to paint all of the SDS2 customers in this light. Uh, so this is a, across all software development. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, customers come to you with a workaround that they think is the solution, mm-hmm. and that's what we get the opportunity in the reviews where we have external stakeholders to like really dig down in and find out. Okay, what's the what problem are you trying to solve? Right, and and that's been a really interesting. Um, so the the key here, the key in, in what you're saying is what's the problem? Yes. So, so, yes. so the problem and and uh, uh, some of our uh, more senior leadership uh, will preach that we should fall in love with our customers problems. We should we should become intimate and fall in love with those the customer problems problems especially their biggest problems so that we really truly understand what is their pain point, right yes yeah we, yes. we, we, we don't we don't want to go straight to we need this yes because this may not be what truly solves that problem right so right. in order to understand and come up with the best solution we first have to really truly understand the problem yes and 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 that comes that has multiple benefits Mm -hmm. um one if we really understand the problem and can really create a solution that's helpful then obviously the customer benefits Mm -hmm. two if we really understand the problem and we're not coding workarounds then um we benefit as a developer's benefit because we're not maintaining Mm -hmm workarounds mm-hmm. and that makes it much easier long term for maintenance and mm-hmm. maintenance is the bulk of any software especially when you get software like ours which is over i can't even remember how many millions of lines of code we have but it's mature it, yeah we'll yeah, yeah but the the bulk of any work on a software product that lasts over you know a few years is maintenance mm-hmm. and that's what eats up a lot of our time the development sure. time is maintenance sure. and so anything we can do to reduce that maintenance complexity and reduce our our maintenance debt yeah. um, is always beneficial and a lot of that is just diving down into the actual problem that the customer is having what what pain point are they hitting that they need to that they that they want to have solved yeah. yeah 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 that's yeah and i always you know i always try to think of uh well, once we fall in love with that problem and really truly understand it, then the next, then we can then we can all work together to figure out what the real solution is to that, right? And and I always preach so you talk about maintenance and complexity and and you know, as the code base grows, complexity grows, maintenance time grows, all that good stuff. So I always try to preach to people like simple i want simple simple yeah. simple the the simpler the things are and and by simple i don't mean you know that may mean it's going to take four steps to get to the solution versus one but that also means that i don't have to maintain like some of the intertwining inner working things that you know um would happen with a more complex solution, if you will. So, yeah. That and also, in the end, what that means is less workload on us, easier for us. Let's back up. So, yeah, let, and and we get to deliver software faster. Yes. Um, happier customers, all that good stuff. So, more consistent quality. Yeah. I, I know. Uh, I know. I've heard from customers over the last few. Uh, they're not users groups anymore. Summit. Summit. S S two Summit. That um, if I remember correctly. 2019 was a big breaking point for us where like the people were actively telling us the quality has improved in terms of mean <laughs> yeah. time to failure or uh, time between failures. Yeah. Um, and, and a large part of that is the, the scrum process and the scrum framework mm-hmm. and <clears throat> the information, the way that we're handling the information, but also the fact that um, scrum agile in general, mm-hmm. but scrum in particular, uh, really emphasizes the ownership of the product by the team. So the team is accountable and responsible for the quality that it puts out mm-hmm. um, and for completing the the sprint goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and what it does is it, some teams operating well will say, this isn't good. 
we can't put this out. Right. And so uh, it really, really has cut down on the number of defects that we're releasing. Yeah. Um, you'll never release it to zero because it's impossible, unfortunately. But we've really cut down on the number of defects being released and increased the stability yeah. um, of the software because of that, because that ownership by the by the developers uh, really makes them think about, well, am I going to put this out? Mm -hmm. Because this is not not good. It doesn't right. work well, or or we've discovered a bug, right. so we can't right. put that out like this. Makes sense. And it's a big part of the Scrum framework is the accountability right. that comes with it. Very good. Very good. Well, that gives us a pretty good look into kind of a little bit of complexities of uh, you know what what we uh, what we I say we again. I'm no developer. I would would never claim to be, but um, so when I say we. That gives us a little bit of a good look into uh, the process that our developers here uh, kind of go through some of the challenges, some of the complexities and such. So um, good stuff. Good stuff. I do what I can. I, yeah, well, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to join me here today. Yeah, thank you. Thank and you, for you know what? Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. And uh, you know what? Maybe we uh, maybe we need to have you back and talk more philosophy because I know I know you got a lot of philosophy up in there, but uh, I do. You know, oh, only a limited amount of times because I'm a nerd. That's my favorite part. <laughs> I I wasn't gonna say. So I could spend since you did that's hours, okay. yeah, hours doing it. But okay. that's because I I enjoy it. Yeah, very good. Well, again, I appreciate it. And yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, not a problem. Appreciate everybody uh, listening today, and we'll see you next time on Stealing Whiskey.